Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the pioneer spirit. Oregon, a true story of the pioneer spirit that is America. Our first act curtain will rise in a moment, but first... Young woman, how about your future? Does it include an interesting and important job? A job that will take you to the exciting places of the world? Places where tomorrow's history is being made today? Right now, young women like yourself are urgently needed to serve their country in the Women's Army Corps. Here's your opportunity to secure your future. Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and get all the facts today. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Woman of Oregon. In 1836, America's foot rested uneasily on the threshold of her west. The Louisiana Purchase had extended the frontier of the United States to the Rocky Mountains, but beyond lay a disputed region, the southern half of which belonged to Mexico, and to the north was the Oregon Territory to become the prize of the country which settled it first. In perfect purple state, the silent mountains waited for the contest to begin, and in the shaded valleys, unseen and hidden, Indian drums beat restlessly, waiting too. It was the lifelong dream of a young physician, Marcus Whitman, to settle a portion of the great Oregon Territory. His first trip into this region had convinced him it could be done. Many scoffed at the idea, others warned him against it. But there was one who listened to his dream, who longed to share in its realization. Her name? My sister Whitman. I can tell you about her. I'm Joe Bonner, fur trapper in the Nebraska Territory. Nothing much surprises me. But that spring of 1836, you can bet I was surprised. Seeing a woman heading for the Oregon country. Come all the way from western New York, her and her husband. Not far out of St. Louis, Dr. Whitman had stopped to give medical help to some settlers, and that's how come they missed the river crossing with a wagon train. And how come I offered to guide their party through the Indian country ahead. We were deep into Pawnee territory when we come to a river. You say we must cross the river before nightfall, Marcus? As much as we have to get on, dearest, we can't risk taking the livestock and cattle across at night. Half a day lost, when every hour is vital. Bonner's scouting along the banks, hope of finding a safer place to cross. Well, if we don't catch up with a wagon train at Fort William, we'll have to turn back. We aren't equipped to travel through the Rockies. Now, sister, we must catch up with them before Fort William. Every day our danger grows greater here in Pawnee Territory. I look at you... Bearing it so gallantly. Paul, oh, have you forgotten the girl in Prattsburg who wanted to share your dream? Oh, don't you imagine she wants to share your dangers, Whitman. too? Whitman! Bonner, something's wrong. What is it, man? What's the matter? A party upriver. Caught in the current. It's sweeping them downstream. Are they Pawnees? Yeah, except for their leader. He's a white man. What can we do to help them? If we stretch a rope across the river, they'll be able to cling to that. We can't save their rafts. They're too heavily loaded. And then put every available man to work. We must try and save them. Here come the rafts. The ropes across and secure on the other side. Oh, if they only hold when those rafts hit them. Even if they snap, we'll be able to pull the men ashore. Why don't they jump from the raft? Fools, don't they see the rope? Mm, they're afraid to jump. He's making them stick to the rafts. He can't hope to save the cargo. Doesn't he know that? The way those rafts are loaded. Jump! Jump for you, drive! Tell your men to jump and hold to the rope. Jump! Never mind the cargo. 
You can't save it, jump! <laughs> Mrs. Whitman? Well, yes, Mr. Burkhan. That was a good meal you prepared. Well, thank you. You'll be glad to know that my husband is tending to the Indian who was injured. Tending to him? Marcus is a doctor. Indians are very strong. I just assume... Well, you... You can't mean that after asking them to risk their lives. I didn't ask them to take any chances I wasn't willing to take myself. To save that cargo. Must have been very important. It was. Man works hard for something all his life, then sees it lost in a minute. You say you plan to settle in Oregon? Thought of that myself. Want to be some nice little places springing up along the Willamette River before long? Well, we plan to go deeper into Oregon than that. Deeper? My husband met the chief of the Cayuse tribe last year. The Cayuse? Has he told you anything about that tribe? Well, I'm well aware our task won't be an easy one, but... The first step in settling peacefully among the Indians is... To bring them to an understanding of the white man's ways. And of the white man's God. <laughs> You won't get very far playing missionary among the Cayuse. Well, their chief has asked my husband to return and teach his people. And you were brave enough to come along. Mrs. Whitman, I admire you. I'd uh, like to join your party. Your plans seem to be changing abruptly with the loss of your cargo. On the contrary. This fits in very well with my plans. Matter of fact, I could be very helpful through this stage of your journey. You never know what the Pawnees are going to do next. Not too warlike, still not predictable either. But I've done a few favors for their chief. Uh, was your cargo intended for the chief of the Pawnees? The cargo is at the bottom of the river. And of no further concern, Mrs. Whitman. What was your cargo, Mr. Burkhan? <laughs> Everything ready for the crossing, Barney? Everything ready. First, let me show you something. Where, where did you find that? Followed a hunch and took a little trip down river during the night. Found it washed up on the banks. A gun. So this was the cargo Mr. Burkhan was taking into Pawnee territory. Where is he? Marcus, is it wise to let him see that we know? Mrs. Whitman is right. But knowing this, can we let him join our parties? He says he wants to. Refuse him and we may have trouble on our hands. Especially here in Pawnee country. Why is he arming the Pawnees? Does it have anything to do with his plan to settle in Oregon? An attack by the Pawnees on one Oregon tribe would mean the defeat of all of our hopes, wouldn't it? The Indians would know the weapons came from the white men. All chance of settling peacefully among them would be gone. And yet, what Mr. Bonner says is true. If we don't permit this man to join our party, we may never reach the wagon train alive. <laughs> Unless more time is lost, Bonner promises me we'll be at Fort William by sundown tomorrow. Marcus, Mr. Burkhan spent another night away from the camp. Probably holding another of his night meetings with our unseen Pawnee escort. Does he intend to stay with us even after we rejoin the wagon train? Being associated with us gives him the disguise he needs. That way he has a chance of winning the confidence of the Indians. Only to sell them out to the Pawnees. Oh, it was our hope to carry a promise of peace into the Oregon country. Now, we're like the carriers of a disease that could spread through the whole West. I made good my promise to the Whitmans. Got them, their crew, and livestock to Fort William by sundown of the next day. Jim Burkhan was now a member of their party. Nothing could prevent that. But at least the wagon train was waiting for him at the fort, and their journey through the Rockies would be a safe one. And so I left them on the stony doorstep of the Rockies, and though I was never to see them again, I was to hear more, much more, of Narcissa Whitman. I can tell you about Narcissa Whitman. I'm Captain McLaughlin, at the time Commodore of the fort at Walla Walla, the first stop in Oregon country. I remember Mrs. Whitman the day she walked into my office. She was very tired from her journey across the Rockies. But nevertheless, she was anxious to get started with her work. Now, uh, Mrs. Whitman, I presume you're aware of my reasons for suggesting the trip your husband's now making to the Willamette Valley? 
Well, I imagine because the mission there is well established, and running it would involve no hardship for a woman. And Mrs. Whitman, you propose to go among the Cayuse Indians, one of the trickiest and cruelest tribes in all the Northwest. Last year, my husband talked with the chief of the Cayuse, who asked him to return to instruct his tribe. We want to believe that control of the savages can come through peace and love alone. But we've learned some very hard lessons, Mrs. Whitman. Our men never travel into that country except in groups. You propose to go unprotected. Well, perhaps going among them that way will show them that we wish to live peacefully with them. As yet, they've had no proof of this. Mrs. Whitman, you're a very courageous woman. Excuse but I... me, Captain McLaughlin and Mrs. Whitman. Mr. Burkhorn, I believe I... I was in the next room waiting to see you. The door was open. I couldn't help hearing. What I have to tell you may help out with your concern over Mrs. Whitman's safety among the Cayuse Indians. You see, last night a white man attended the sickness of Chief Umtipi's wife. A white man? Yes, and they expect her to get better. The white man is going back tonight to make an agreement with Chief Umtipi about the right to settle in Cayuse country. This white man was yourself, Mr. Burkhardt. That's right. Mr. Burkhardt, this sort of unofficial action is what causes trouble. It's a very fortunate thing the patient lived. Doesn't it give us the foothold we need among the Indians? It gives us a footing based on the white doctor as a medicine man. Well, when Dr. Whitman returns, he can explain to the chief that things sometimes go wrong. Captain McLaughlin, I think there are some things I should tell you about Mr. Burkhardt. How long a I... journey has, Dr. Whitman? Several days through some unhealthy country, isn't it? Uh, uh, what were you about to tell me, Mrs. Whitman? Nothing. Only what a help Mr. Burkhan has been to us and how gratefully we would accept any assistance he might be able to offer. <laughs> Dr. Whitman, it's good to be able to welcome you back. But tell me, is your decision still unaltered? I must go among the Cayuse. Even in the light of what has happened? What are you referring to? Well, I, uh, I wonder if you're prepared to hear it. What is it, Captain McLaughlin? Last night, the wife of the Cayuse chief died. Oh. Burkhan, who tried to heal her, is also dead. Cayuse justice, Dr. Whitman. Sort of thing that makes me ask you to make no decision till you've considered the dangers. No, Susan. Perhaps Captain McLaughlin's right. Well, isn't a promise a consideration above all thought of danger? Isn't there too much work ahead to undo the harm that's been done? And shouldn't we begin that work at once? <laughs> You are listening to the proudly we hail production, Woman of Oregon. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. Here's an opportunity for you young women of America, an opportunity to get in step with the smartest. Today, the rapidly expanding Women's Army Corps needs qualified young women between the ages of 18 and 34. This is your chance to do an important job. The pay is good with excellent prospect of rapid advancement. Why not check with your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today? You'll find that it's easy to get in step with these proud American women who are serving their country in the Women's Army Corps. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. Now we present the second act of Woman of Oregon. At a time when the future of the United States in North America lay in the peaceful settling of her West, Narcissa Whitman came with her husband to live with the Cayuse Indians in the heart of the Oregon country. The story of this first white woman to cross the American continent continues as it is told in the chronicles and memories of the time. Captain McLaughlin continues his account. Yes, I can tell you about Narcissa Whitman. Though I was to see her only when I visited the Cayuse village of Wailatpu. Which means in the Cayuse tongue, place of the rye grass. It came to mean much more than that to people familiar with the story of Narcissa Whitman and her husband. They had surmounted tremendous odds to become the first white settlers in a hostile country. I remember the day of my first visit. A day marked by a foreboding. I had quite a welcome for you, Captain McLaughlin. 
Marcus has prevailed upon the chief of the tribe to come and meet you today. The chief holds himself aloof, which is certainly more than his people do. Marcus, do you think he'll come? Think he will. Look out the window. They've just ridden out of the clearing. Oh, that waterfall of feathers could only belong to a chief. So, that's Chief um, Tippy, huh? Marcus, why do you look so troubled? Yes, what is it, Whitman? What's wrong? Take a close look, Narcissa. They're closer now. Can't you tell that isn't um, Tippy? Wait. It's his son wearing the chief's headdress. Let's go outside to meet him. Very well, Marcus. Come, Captain McLaughlin. I can't understand this. That boy's rash and hot-headed. Surely they've not made him chief of the tribe. <laughs> Greetings, Chilokai. White doctor. I bring you regret of my father, who no longer has place of chief in our council. You are now chief in his place, Tilukai? Tilukai is young in years, but old with wisdom of chiefs before him. Then you believe as your father taught? Wisdom of tribe, older than length of years my father ruled. I come to meet white men from fort to learn what his visit means. Chief Tilukai, this is Captain McLaughlin. This is a friendly visit to learn of your progress. He's happy to see your church nearly completed. He wants to hear the voices of the children humming the hymns they've learned. Children sing only in praise of Chief Tulukai this day. May I offer my congratulations, Chief Tulukai? I hope the same harmony will exist between you and your white friends that existed when your father was chief. Chief Tulukai shows same friendship if white men pay for work Indians do. Pay? What's that? We have no funds, Chief Tulukai. Pay for work which your people seem to do gladly. It is their church they build. In exchange for the care my wife has shown the children who come to our kitchen, your father promised a nurse for her child soon to be born. Chief Tulukai, give all this if white men pay. Oh, Marcus! Uh, Mrs. Whitman, when I return to the fort, I'll see what can be done in the way of raising money. You can't let your great effort die here. Already word of it has reached the eastern seaboard. More and more people are coming to settle in the west. We must do what we can. It's useless to meet this threat and only find another means of blackmail. No, I must talk to Chief Tilokai as I talk to his father. And in the meantime? In the meantime, take no word of this back with me. But, Dr. Whitman, I'll have to alert the fort in word case... Word of this incident will discourage the migration you speak of. Only by encouraging people to come west can we hope to settle it for the United States. And Captain McLaughlin, this is a plentiful reward for the spending of a... Few uneasy hours. Now, Sister Whitman spoke only of the hours, not of the months of unrest and uncertainty. Months of waiting for the new chief to lay aside his arrogance and feeling of hostility. Waiting for the help that they would need as the hour approached for her child to be born. Alice Clarissa Whitman was the first white child born in Oregon. Date was March 14th, 1837. A week later, I was present at her christening in the church that still stood incompleted and open to the sky. Marcus, look. Coming slowly in at the front of the church, standing along the walls. Yes, Indian women with their children. They're standing so quietly, almost in awe and reverence. Can it be they feel a spiritual bond with us today? Look at their faces, so full of wonder. Oh, you know, I, I feel that somehow with the birth of our child is born the understanding that something universal and wonderful works for the white man and for the Indian alike. Oh, this day may be the birth of new hope. Narcissa was right. The feeling grew that the place in which the child was christened was a home she wished to share with others. The Cayuse gave the house of God a roof. They gave the child a nurse. Chief Tilukai talked of mutual help and cooperation with Marcus. It wasn't long before Narcissa Whitman stood with her husband at the door of her home in the tall rye grass and saw the first immigrant wagons from the east go by into the waiting land of Oregon. But her happiness was not destined to last. When tragedy struck, it came swiftly. 
with an aftermath of trouble. Thank you for coming, Captain McLaughlin. I wonder if it was wise. Doctor, I, um, I had to know if you felt anyone was responsible for what happened. No. I'll tell you exactly how it happened. You'll see that it's no one's fault, really. Perhaps mine for leaving my family alone. Well, it was necessary for you to be away those three days. My wife always carries on my duties in my absence. So she went yesterday to care for an Indian child who was sick. And she returned to an evening that the house was empty. The Indian nurse was gone. So was our child. She called frantically for both of them. Finally, she could think of only one thing. The lake. And that's where she found the child. Yes. Too late to save her. I learned this morning why the nurse was gone. Brave came and carried her off. Seems this was the woman destined to become the bride of Chief Tilkai. And the child wandered out of doors and tore the lake. Now, since at least of all would wish the place uh, to place the blame for the child's death on anyone, but I fear our understanding with the Indians has reached another crisis because of this. See, they fear reprisals from the fort. Yes. Another wall goes up. Uh, tell me, will you stay here, Dr. Whitman? Our sister would not want to go. She would not want the death of our child to be in vain. She'd want the tragedy to bring us closer in feeling to the Cayuse people. That may be possible. I can't be sure. On September 30th, 1839... Marcus Whitman left for Washington to talk to President Van Buren about allotting expenses for the aid of settlers. Narcissa faced the winter alone, preparing to stay in the home she and Marcus had built. There were nights of terror for Narcissa Whitman, moments when her great courage was almost bound to fail. The next summer, Marcus returned at the head of a large train of missionaries. They went to all parts of Oregon. When I took my leave of the Whitmans, I left them in their home. Though I was never to see them again, I was soon to hear the ending that fate wrote to her story. Let me tell you about Narcissa Whitman. I'm Catherine Sager, the oldest of seven orphan children who lost both mother and father on their journey through the Rockies. But our brother John kept us alive and in good spirits all the rest of the way to Oregon till our cart, drawn by two thin and weary oxen, brought us to the doorstep of Narcissa Whitman. Marcus! Marcus, come quickly, dear. Oh, help me lift these children from the cart. Oh, these poor, poor children. This boy must have guided you. He can't be over 13. He's very near exhaustion. Ma'am. Ma'am, I... I... Oh. He's fainted. I'll lift him out of the car. We must make them clean and comfortable and find places for them to sleep. Marcus, oh, this little girl, her leg's broken. We must make it well again. We stayed with the Whitmans in their home, and it became our home. And we grew to be healthy, happy children as Oregon gradually came to be settled around that Indian village where the silken grass grew tall and where the Indians grew restless at the fear that soon the settlers would trample that tall grass. In spite of the repeated promises of the Whitmans, this trust reached giant proportions. And then it happened. It was unforeseen and sudden, and perhaps nothing could have prevented it. For when it broke out, a case of measles among the children, care was taken to keep it from spreading to the Indians. But when it did, Evil stories spread about the doctor who had brought disease to kill the members of the tribe. Dr. Whitman was at the fort when the news reached him. He hurried back to his home. Marcus. Oh, Marcus, you shouldn't have come, dear. I had to. Are the children all together in the other room? Yes. Keep them there, dearest. Don't let them know, no matter what happens. What are you going to do? If they've come to take a life, perhaps mine will do. Oh, no. Let me stay here and see. It's the only way. Oh, Marcus. Our life together has been rich and full. While our arms have embraced each other, our dreams have embraced a continent. Go quickly to the children. Yes, my dearest. Uh, 
What is it, Mrs. Whitman? What's oh, wrong? Uh, nothing, Catherine, nothing. And uh, we mustn't let the children think there's anything wrong. We, uh, we must get them to sing. If there is something... No, no. Help me, Catherine. Rock of ages. Clap, Clap to me. me. Oh, what was that? Oh, they've broken in. Marcus! Catherine, take the children up into the loft at once. Marcus! Chief, protect tribe. You won't kill the children. Chief, kill white woman if she reach for gun of husband. What chance have we if I don't... You reach, I kill. I... I... Have my husband gun. She go into other room. Catch her before she reach stairs. <laughs> she go upstairs. She not get far with blood coming from arm. I can still hold this gun. It's aimed at you. If... Your braves take one step up these stairs. I'll fire at you with my husband's gun. Put gun down. Not if you intend to harm these children. Put gun down. Promise me. No harm will come to them. We burn evil from house. We spare children. Uh, we brought no evil. Only a hope. And a dream. The blood flowed from her arm and the life from her body. She died protecting the Sager children. And though they burned the house, no harm came to us. We were soon released and taken to the fort and offered a home in another part of the Oregon country. The others went, but I preferred to stay close to the monument erected that year above the graves of Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, who had brought a hope to Oregon, a hope fulfilled and a dream come true. Have you noticed the new, trim, whack uniform worn by the young women who are serving in the Women's Army Corps? This new uniform not only stamps the wearer as being smartly dressed, it also indicates that she is doing her part to keep America strong. If you are a young woman between 18 and 34 and can qualify, you are urged to do your part in making unity, strength, freedom a reality. Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and enlist in the Women's Army Corps today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>